Amen. That's one of my favorite songs that Brandy sings. That one and, and Christ Alone, she sings that sometimes. And those are probably my two favorites. Um, songs about being redeemed. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I am. I don't have to worry about where I stand with God. Even though in my fallen state I fail Him and I come short, that's no secret. But through Christ I'm redeemed and I'm forgiven. And when God looks at me, He doesn't love me based on how good of a Christian I am. He loves me because of Jesus. And that boy, that helps me. That helps me. Because most days, 365 out of 365, I don't do so good. And if Him loving me and supplying my needs and answering my prayers and providing hope for me was based on how good of a day I could have, uh, you'd have to have you another pastor, I guess. I'd be so depressed I couldn't get out of the house. But God's love is not burdened down with my actions. Oh, it's on the cross. Amen. Redeemed. Redeemed. Heard somebody say one time that, um, you know, the Bible talks about when we get to heaven, we'll sing a song or that uh, the angels don't know. And somebody said, and I think it's pretty pretty good uh, topic of conversation, but maybe we might be singing about redemption, something they don't understand. They don't know what redeeming is all about. They don't know what it's like to be lost and then be found, to be guilty, but then innocent. But one day we'll get to see the one that did that for us. Aren't you excited for that? I hope you're excited for that because it's coming soon. I was talking to uh, uh, brother, your name just slipped my mind, Angie's brother. <laughs> Angie's brother, uh, the better looking one. Can I call you, can I call you that? Can I call you that? Okay. <laughs> I was talking to that dear brother, uh, his wife has gone on to be with the Lord, and, and we were talking before church about how it's not going to be long till we're going to take our journeys, whether we go by the grave or by the sky, I don't see things tarrying much longer for us, and we'll get to see that one that's redeemed us, amen? You got your Bibles, go with me into your Old Testament this morning, but to the book of Judges, the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter number 17, Judges chapter 17. We live in a world that uh, I think sometimes we think has changed a whole lot or that things are different now than they used to be. Or when we read the Bible and we see the days of the Bible and we compare them to the days we live in now that they're somehow different or offset or we found new ways to do things that are sinful and against God. But the truth of the matter is nothing really has changed. Humanity has been the same since the beginning. We've been prone to fall, we've been prone to sin, make mistakes, and want to do things our way. The book of Judges is a wonderful example of just that. Uh, the theme throughout the book of Judges is a verse that we'll read here in just a minute, Judges chapter 17, if you're not already there, Judges 17. But we tend to think as we look at things today, and if you're alive, you've noticed that the way we're doing things seems different than it was 50, 60, 100 years ago. The way we deal with our kids, the way we raise our families, the way we approach church, the way they, we deal with things of the Bible. A lot of this stuff to us is changing as we've gotten older. Maybe you remember a day coming up where things were more black and white, and it seems now we live more in a, a gray area on a lot of things. And we kind of sometimes think that that's new, that that's a modern problem. But the truth of it is that problem's been around for a very long time. And it's bound up in the hearts of us all. It's called sin. Now, I want to show you in Judges chapter 17 a day not much different than the one we live in today. I want to preach to you this morning on an old problem in a new age. An old problem in a new age. Judges chapter 17 tells us of a young man named Micah. Judges 17, 1 through verse number 6. If you've got it this morning, say amen. The Bible says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother. 
And his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them unto a founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods, and made an ephod and a teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Father, we stand in your presence this morning very thankful to do so. God, we don't deserve to uh, have the opportunities that we so enjoy on this earth. Lord, we look at uh, what we deserve. We look at what we've earned by our behavior, and we don't see much. But, Father, through your mercy and your grace, you've blessed us abundantly. You've given us time, opportunity, chance to be here today. Now, God, I thank you for that. I thank you for every song my ears have heard, or it's been a blessing. It's been refreshing in a difficult week. And I pray, God, as now we stand before your word, that you'll speak to us softly, tenderly as you will. Let us hear you. Let us block out the things that scream for our attention, that we may hear you. We love you, Father. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be seated. Thank you for standing with me. I don't know if you've ever heard of this man, but there's a, uh, a man who is what they call an apologist, or he does apologetics. Now, what that word means is a defense of the faith. It goes from the book of Peter, where it says, Be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Well, there's a man who is from uh, India, uh, Ravi Zacharias, and brilliant man. Uh, and he goes around the country, and he will do question and answers and lectures at universities about apologetics about a defense of the faith, defense of the Bible, defense of Jesus Christ, Christianity, all these other things. And I listen to him a lot because I think that's a good thing. I think we need to stand up, as Brother uh, Jimmy talked about in Sunday school, somebody needs to stand up in the voice of all this mess and say there's one Bible, one God, one Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the lie. And I was listening to something he said, and he told this story. He said he was at a university, and after a lecture, he gives the audience time to do questions back to him. And uh, one young man stood up and, and said that he did not believe in absolutes, which is common in this world we live in today. Absolute truth was what he was referencing. Now, what that means is an absolute truth would be something is definitely right and something is definitely wrong. We get that in the Bible. We are told certain things are good and right. Certain things are wrong. But this man who has been caught up in this, he said, well, I don't believe in absolute truth. I don't believe that. I believe truth is relative. That means truth for you is going to be different than truth for you. And he didn't believe in good and evil. And he, Zechariah said that he told the young man, he said, well, let me ask you this. If I was to bring a one-year-old child up on this stage and, and take a knife and, and, and kill this child... Would you say that was evil? And they said the young man just kind of put his head down, who's at a prestigious university. He lifted his head up and he says, you know, I wouldn't like what you did, but I couldn't say it was evil. And you see how we're turning. You see a young man who is brilliant. He's able to go to a college that, that, that I, they wouldn't even look at my application if I was to send them one. The future probably going to go into the, a field of engineering or science or medical field to try to help people or change the world. But when it comes to things of right and wrong, truth and error and God, he just can't accept it. And, we, and I heard that and, and the people in the audience did exactly what you did. They, they gasped at that. How can somebody think that way? How can they imagine seeing a scene as that and not thinking that that's evil? Friends, it's the world that we're living in. However, some of us like to say, well, this earth's going to hell in a handbasket. It's been going there. <laughs> the earth's been going, but I'll tell you where I'm going. I'm going to Jesus one day. Amen? I'll tell you, the things in this world, the things going on, the thought processes, the, the ideologies, the thinking of the culture today, it's not new. It's been around a long time. Let me share a word with you you may have heard before, postmodernism. This is really the age we're living in. This is what they call it in the secular world. And here's, in a nutshell, what it means. It means reality is not what we understand it to be, what we've been taught to be, or what we've been told it is. But it's determined by the individual's reality. What you think is right and wrong. What you think is real or fake. Um, it's subject to change, and we're not identified by ideas or history we're determined by the truth, or not determined by truth, but by what society thinks. We can just be whatever we want to be. You see that a lot because you've got now 
a lot of people who identify as this or that. I identify as a millionaire, but that that worked for me. <laughs> Every time I go to the bank, tell them I identify as a millionaire, and I want to withdraw my million dollars. That has yet to work for me. So me identifying as a, a woman or a, anything like that, I, f I figure it's going to get about the same result. But postmodernism teaches us today that nothing is solid. Nothing is stable. Everything is just what you make of it. Uh, life is what you make of it. The truth has no basis. There's no foundation. You, you know, the Bible's a book. It's a fine book, whatever. But we don't have to live by that. It's just a book. You just make life what you want it to be. Heard this story of the same man, Mr. Zacharias. He was uh, asked by another student at a big university, Oxford, or one of them. He said, uh, and again, he brought up, why are you afraid of, of, of uh, not identifying or why are you afraid of not accepting that there is no good and evil? What scares you about that? Why can't we just be people who are all living together and, and we're all going to take care of each other and do good? Why do we even have to have moral laws and moral absolutes? Why do we need all that? You've been harping on it. What's it matter? None of that stuff matters. Why are you so afraid to say that we live in a postmodern world? And he got up and he says, can I ask you a question? Do you lock your doors at night? And he said, oh, of course I do. Well, see, that's the issue. All of the, the, and it, good and evil exist. We know that. But in a postmodern world, not necessarily. What you do that you think is evil, if you don't think it's evil, that's okay. You don't believe me, go to the courts of America today. Listen to a defense lawyer and a prosecutor argue a case. You're going to hear one argue that this law was broken, this right was wrong, and it deserves punishment. Well, then you're going to hear a defense attorney say, well, but, you know. Yeah, maybe what they did wasn't the greatest in the world, but here's why they did it. To them, it wasn't that bad. To them, it was how they had to get by. To them, it was a necessity. So what might be true in black and white wasn't true for this person in that instance. And some judge will say, well, you know, he's probably right. You know, we, we don't understand everything, so I'm going to find you not guilty of this. And you see how it just begins to turn and turn until we get into a society where there is no right and wrong. There is no good and evil. And you see what's happening to Micah and his house happening right now. See if you notice any parallels. Go back to verse 1 of Judges chapter 17. I want to give you four thoughts this morning. Shouldn't take me more than a couple hours, so y'all just hang in there. Fade, you bring sandwiches in case anybody gets hungry? You forgot them. Okay. We'll cut it down to an hour 50, okay, just for your just for your benefit. But in verse 1, let's just jump right in there. I want to show you, first of all, a postmodern family. I want to show you a postmodern family. Verse 1 says, There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. He said unto his mother, The 1,100 shekels of, 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 that's hard to say, shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, and I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou the Lord of my son, or blessed be thou the Lord, my son. Now, I hope that as I read that verse, there were uh, red flags going off everywhere if you're a parent. I hope that you saw so much wrong with that verse that you're reading it again. There is so much wrong with what happens in verse 2, but however, it's exactly what we're seeing today. Take a look at this. He said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, spakest also in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. First thing is, he stole from his parents. Eleven hundred shekels of silver. Now, different estimates from different people, but I read one that said that's about 28 pounds of silver. And you equivalent that over to money today, that's eight to ten thousand dollars. You take inflation and price differences from back then. It's a small fortune. So this kid stole everything. This kid stole all the savings, all the money that his mother had. That's a problem. That's a problem. And in the world today, we're seeing a lot of this. Have you ever seen a day when so many kids was just out of control? Now, when I mean out of control, I'm talking about killing their parents, uh, having their parents put in jail for false accusations and false claims, uh, uh, suing their parents, destroying their parents' credit, stealing their parents' credit. The stuff I see on a week-to-week -week basis is almost beyond comprehension. But we're living in a postmodern society. How is it that kids get in that kind of shape? When we move away from what the Word of God says and we move into what society says. How many of you raised your kids with this thought? 
Well, I didn't have nothing when I was growing up, so I'm going to make sure they have more than I had. It's a noble thought. It's a noble thought, but it can get you in a world of trouble. <laughs> it's a noble thought, but it can get you in a world of trouble. If you come up during the Depression, you probably didn't have much. You had a stick and a, and a, and a bean can, and that was your toy. You know, you went out and rolled it up and down the street, and that, that was your game. Maybe you got older and you had a, a soccer ball and a, and, a, and a BB gun. That was all you had. And you think, well, you know, well, we got bored, didn't have nothing. You know, and as we're coming along, we're trying to make our kids' lives better. But in doing so, sometimes we create micas. We create micas. And by doing that, Micah had lost all respect for his parents. To the point to where he knew where their money was, he went and stole it. I've worked with kids who have went and stolen their parents' alcohol, drunk it all up. Now, there's a whole other issue there that I just told you about. But they went and drunk all their parents' alcohol. Parent, uh, kids who go and take their parents' uh, firearms. We see that. Take them to schools or malls or places and, and shoot other people. I had a friend of mine, a cousin, in high school. He was a football player, 6'4", a stud. I mean a stud of a football player. Uh, was shooting guns with a friend of his, and the, and the friend turned the gun on him, shot him in the back, paralyzed him from the waist down, ended everything for him. He, he nearly gave up on life itself what causes that what causes that it's when you move away from the word of God when you move away from teaching kids that there is a right and there is a wrong that there are things that are okay to do that you should do there are things that are definitely not right to do now Micah was one of these kids who evidently had a, uh, a barrier there now notice some more 1100 shekels of silver which thou takest now notice what he says about his mama about which thou cursest and spake of also in mine ears. Uh-oh, wasn't just Micah, it was Mama. Mama had some issues too. What happened? Mama went and seen that the money got stole. What'd she do? She cusses the blue streak. Which one of you such and such and so and so's took my money? I can't believe you idiots, you stupid kids. I knew yous would do this. Yous are sorry. Or the killings, you blankety blank such and so and such and such. I knew you're sorry. You're just like your father. You're just like your uncle. You're just like so and so. You're useless. You're no good. You're a brat. You deserve to be in jail. That's what this mama was doing to the child. Mama's dad, let me tell you something. When you treat a child like that, don't be shocked when they grow up and they act like Micah. When you treat a child like that, don't be shocked when they grow up and do the same thing you do. If you scream at your child, your child is then going to scream at others. If you cuss at your child, your child will then cuss at other people. I deal with parents all the time who say, well, little Johnny, he's got a mouth like a sailor. Eight years old, he can out cuss, he can out cuss one. He knows more bad words than anybody I know, that little S-O so-and-so. So little Johnny cusses, huh? Yeah, boy, he can say blank and blank and blank and blank. Is that right? Well, bring little Johnny in here. Let's, let's take a look at him. Johnny, get your blankety blank in here. I told you to stay off that blankety blank thing. You tearing up blankety blank stuff. Little Johnny comes and says, what the blankety blank you want? <laughs> and Mama says, see? <laughs> I see it every day. Mamas and daddies, grandparents, if you cuss around your children or grandchildren, you cannot get on to them when they start to cussing. You best eat the bit of the soap yourself before you go to shoving it in their mouth. Listen, Micah's mama set Micah up for failure because she didn't do what the Bible said to do. Postmodernism. Uh, she came up and she decided, well, I'm going to raise mine. Hey, you know, this is how I'm going to do it. This is the way I want to do it. Not the way the Bible says. The Bible says don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't sit there and make them mad, make them angry. Tell them what's right. Tell them what's wrong. So mama here is cussing and getting in his ear. That's what he says. And I like how he brings this up. Mama, you remember that money that you've been cussing and screaming at me about? Here, I got it. I took it. Now we see another failure here. The mother says, Blessed be, thou, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. This whole mess is twisted. This whole bunch is messed up. Their rights and wrongs are all destroyed. He ain't got a clue. Mama ain't got a clue. This whole bunch is messed up. Why? Because it's a postmodern family that looks at life through the lens of what they think is right and wrong, what society says is right and wrong, and not what the Word of God says is right and wrong. I see it every day, all the time. And I have my struggles too because in secular uh, psychology, they teach you that you ought to address certain things with kids a certain way. And I struggle with that because sometimes I want to use that to address my kids. And then Brandy has to bring back to reality and says, no, right is right and wrong is wrong no matter why they did it. And then I have to kind of get my mind back in it. 
And amen, kids, right's right and wrong's wrong, ain't it, Bryce? Go like this. <laughs> Mama's always right, ain't she, Bryce? Go like this. <laughs> There's a show on TV, a real popular show. I've seen it once, and that was enough. The Modern Family, y'all seen that? Good. <laughs> Some of y'all's lying. Some of y'all's lying. As much as you're sitting here, you're lying. The modern family. Now, what's the modern family about? What's about a postmodern family who doesn't subscribe to the norms? It does what it wants to do. Relationships are what they want it to be. And no matter what it is, it's right. Kids do what they want to do, and that's right. Husbands act the way they want to act, and that's right. Wives do what they want to do, and that's right. No matter what they do, it's funny, and it's right. And man, that show's great. And if we're not careful, that becomes the catalyst for what we do. Can you see how quickly things start to fall apart? when we do what's right in our own eyes, when we walk away from the Bible, the Word of God. Not only is Micah in a postmodern family, but I want you to see verse 3. I want you to see a postmodern faith. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. Now that sounds good right there, don't it? Well, that was going to the church. You know, that was going to help the poor to benefit the ministries of the church to get the gospel out there <laughs> watch this right turn to make a graven image and a molten image now therefore I will restore it unto thee well that didn't take long she's won't make idols verse 4 says yet he restored the money unto his mother and his mother took 200 shekels of silver gave them to a founder that's a blacksmith who made thereof a graven image and a molten image and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods. He made ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his own sons who became his priest. Postmodern family, postmodern faith. Now I want you to see, faith intrinsically is not denied here. Faith as it is, spiritual things as it were, are not denied by mother here. They're just warped and twisted. We live in a world that has kind of in a way stopped denying God's existence altogether. Atheism's on its way out because science has failed at trying to support atheism. So atheism as a whole is beginning to crumble. But you're seeing an acceptance of God, but it's God how I want God to be. It's God how I think God should be. Well, if God was around now, the Bible would say different things. I know the Bible says that we're not supposed to do this, but... If, that, if, if God was here today, he wouldn't say it that way. What are you drinking? <laughs> My friend, God saw our day. God saw this day. God saw tomorrow. He saw 10 years from now. You know what he saw? The same thing he saw in Micah's house. We are no different than we were then. We've just found new ways to commit old sin. It's an old problem in a new age. Faith is not denied, but faith becomes what they want it to be. Where do we see that? Everywhere. Have you ever seen a time where church is under such attack? Have you seen the new catchphrase for most of the postmodern churches? A church for people who don't like church. So, what is it? <laughs> what is it then? If it's not church, but it's a church for people who don't like church, how can it be a church if you don't like church? You're not going to go to church. Why would you come to church if you don't like it? It's a quagmire. But that's the catchphrase. What is it? This is church the way we want it to be. This is church the way we see it would be. If Jesus was here right now, this is the church Jesus would come to. Now look, I'm not proud, and I'm not going to say if Jesus was here today, he'd come to this church. He'd come straighten me out. what he'd do. I guarantee you that. But I'm not, a lot of people have that idea that this is the way that God wants church to be. If Jesus, when he set up his church, had an idea of a church, boy, it was this one. I'm not that proud nor naive to think that. But I'll tell you what, folks, anybody that make a statement like that has got pride in their heart. And they are, they are um, delusional in their head. Faith has become what they want it to be. Micah's mama said, let's make us a God. Why we got to go to the temple? Let's just make us a little God. We'll call him God. We'll do what they do at the temple, but we'll do it here. I ain't got time to go to church. And I ain't got time to fool with all that. And I tell you what, Micah, tell the old founder after he's done making some idols, tell him to make an ephod, tell him to make the pieces that the high priest wears. <laughs> Micah said, well, what are we going to do with that? And Mama says, well, get one of your boys. He can be the priest. Which one of them didn't go to jail last week? 
Which one of them, which one of them, ain't, which one of them ain't hooked on? Get that one. That'd make a good priest. Let's put it on him. Faith, church, the Word of God became what they wanted it to be. In our world today, people take the Word of God and they push it back and or make it say what they want it to say. My friend, look, God did not need your help to write that Bible. God does not need your help interpreting that Bible because I believe that Bible speaks plainly and clearly on many and all topics. God does not need us to interpret for Him. He needs us to obey Him. We're not to change it. We're to listen to it. My friend, I'll tell you, our lives would be so much better if we'd listen to God and quit trying to make it what we want it to be. Most people's ideas of who God is are not based on Bible. They're based on what they've been told or taught through a church. Some churches teach that God will strike you dead if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Some ch uh, churches teach you're not saved unless you go through X, Y, and Z. Some churches teach that you're not allowed to come here unless you meet this and that requirement. Some churches don't allow you to come all together unless you swear allegiance to them, you know. Is God in that? He ain't a million miles. But what happens is those ideas and thought processes grow up and they get passed on to the next generation. And you see the postmodern faith come in. It's like, we'll just do what we want to do. You remember when Oprah made that statement that you can get to heaven any way you want to? When she first made that statement, people was like, oh, <laughs> Oprah's antichrist. She's got the devil in her. But now they're going to vote for her for president. Yeah, you know why? Postmodern what's right in your own eyes. Postmodern family, all messed up. Postmodern faith, don't know heads from tails. The postmodern faith, by the way, does not worship Christ. It worships self. And if you look at it, I'm not throwing off on anybody's church, but I'll say I've seen a lot that's not glorifying to God. It's not meant to praise God. It's meant to make the people feel good. Now, we have air conditioning, because I want you to feel good. There's padding on half that pew because I want you to feel good. We've got carpet because Sheila would kill me if we didn't. <laughs> we have a roof and electricity because I want you to feel good. But when it comes to what's in this, I love you with everything that's in me. I don't care if you're comfortable. I love you. I swear I do. You just know I hope I love you. But if this makes you uncomfortable, I don't care. You know why? Because it makes me uncomfortable. You know why? Because when I get a good look at Richard through the Word of God, I don't like it. And I don't want to deal with it. You ever read something in the Bible and wish you hadn't read it? I'll never forget the time I read in there that God won't hear your prayers if you mean to your wife. <laughs> I found it. That works both ways, darling. But I told God, I said, God, no, not that. But you know what that was? That was God showing me something. That's why we twist the Bible in a postmodern faith and make it do what we want. Because when we see it for what it really is, sore to divide this soul and cut the sin, cancer from our hearts, we don't like it. The objective of this church, of this body, is not for you to be comfortable. It's for you to come closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that means uncomfort, and if that means a little pain, and if that means you're squirming, and I'm squirming, then bless God, we need to squirm. We need to hurt. We need to know that something's wrong, and we need Christ. What good is a church where we're never feeling that we are come short, or we need to come to Him? When not, we need to do and, and work more, and, and come more, and appreciate Him more. Now, I don't believe one of those churches that just beats their people into a bloody mess every, every service. I've been to those. That's not fun. But I do believe when we look in the Word of God, when we see Him, when we see Him for who He really is, something in my heart should stir. The Word of God should cut into me and say, Oh, I want that. I don't want to be like Micah. And if you're going to read later about Micah, you'll learn a lot more about him. But let's go on. i got to hurry. Postmodern family, postmodern faith. I want you to see the postmodern failure. Verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, why do you call that a failure, preacher? Because that's exactly what it was. You read through the book of Judges, verse 6 is the theme all throughout. There was no king, they did that which was right in their own eyes, and it never worked. It never worked. You know what's going to bring more issues on this earth in the tribulation than anything? The fact that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed. 
and the imaginations of man's hearts will be fully realized. The constraining, restraining authority of the Spirit of God will be removed. What does that mean? That means there'll be nothing to stop the most vilest thought, the most vilest intent. You don't think thoughts are vile? Do you lock your doors? Do you think people are inherently good? Do you lock your doors? Do you, when you go to the mall, do you lock your car? I was in, last night I was talking to a lady, a great Christian lady I know very well. I've never heard her say a negative word about anybody, but she said, when I was walking through the parking lot there and I was praying, I wouldn't get mugged. And I thought, hmm, never heard her talk like that. How do you feel on that stuff? But listen, when we are left to our own devices, it is doom. It is death and it's destruction. Thank God that the Spirit of God is still on this earth. The bad as it is right now, friend, it could be a million times worse, and it will be when God allows the imaginations of man's hearts to run. Jeremiah said, the heart's deceitfully wicked. We like to don't think that, do we? We look at a little baby, we think, oh, that's a precious little baby. And ain't they cute? Ain't babies cute? When I had kids, Brandy, you remember that uh, parenting thing we went to before Bryce was born? They give us a free car seat, son. That's worth it. Six weeks of classes, I'd learn a thing. But... <laughs> I do remember this I remember them saying watch and see when that first one you have is born you just catch yourself staring at it and I thought staring I can't focus on anything for more than 30 seconds when am I going to stare at my own child but when Bryce was born I remember for it seemed like hours just staring at him just watching him when the, I think the last class we did he was born he had had to have his first shot you remember that Nobody told us to give them Tylenol before they get them first shots. We got the full brunt of the sore legs. And he got all them shots, and if he'd move, ah! He's had a big mouth for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember watching him, and I'd watch for him to move. I'd just sit there, and I'd just watch him. And i think, think, well, what's he going to be? Look how sweet. Oh, that's my son. I'm so proud of him. Not once did I think wonder how evil he's going to be. wonder how many times we're going to have to ground him from his PlayStation. <laughs> wonder how many times we're going to have to chase him around and whoop him. That never come to mind. But you see, as we get older, we realize there's something in here. And left unchecked, it's bad. All right. The failure of this way of thinking is this without God nothing is going to work can I tell you there are people today in families who are who I don't want to say doomed but if something don't change their kids are going to be destroyed their family probably already has been destroyed and they look to the world for answers there are no answers in this world only in Jesus I've seen the results of the postmodern faith the postmodern family and it is a postmodern failure now let me give you one more thing and I'm done postmodern fix I'm finished right here I'm done Second Chronicles chapter 7 those of you that like to turn in your Bibles go ahead and flip over Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 those of you who study you probably know this in my heart but I want to show you what the fix is for all this. How do we fix our families, preacher? How do we fix the church and our faith? How do we fix the failure of society? I'll tell you how. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says this. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Can I tell you what we got to do? We got to get back to God. We have got to humble ourselves and acknowledge God, but I'll take it one step further than that. We are a New Testament church. We must acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you won't do that, friend, there's no hope. 
You'll be in a postmodern family, a postmodern faith, and a postmodern failure. But there's a fix for it, and it's always Jesus. The answer for it all is Jesus. You, want, you need help? Turn to Jesus. Your church is in trouble? Turn to Jesus. Your family's in trouble? Turn to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Your kids are in trouble? Point them to Jesus. My friend, He is the beacon of hope and help for us all. Run to Jesus. You're in trouble? Run to Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you better run to Him. Because if you don't, and you die like that, God's going to cast you out. There's a fix for it all. All we got to do is humble ourselves. Acknowledge God. Acknowledge Jesus. Pray. What does that mean? I think that means pray for forgiveness. Pray God forgive us of what we've done. National Day of Prayer was last week. And uh, one of the best prayers I ever heard prayed on National Day of Prayer. I don't remember who did it. But I remember this person standing up on a national stage and saying, God, forgive us for what we've done. We've pushed you out. We've pushed you back. We've not acknowledged that you're God. We've ignored your word. We've done everything you've told us not to do. And I was about to shout. That's the best prayer I've ever heard on a, on a platform like that where the world could hear. I thought, God, boy, keep praying. I don't know if he wrote it or that was from his heart or what. Maybe it was both. I don't know. But man, I keep going. Keep praying. That's what God wants to hear. He, doesn't, he needs to hear us say, we have sinned. We are wrong. We've messed up. That's part of being humble. Pray and seek my face. How do we seek his face? Get in the word of God. Turn from their wicked ways. What's our wicked ways? It's sin. <laughs> Postmodern, whatever you want to call it, humanism, it's all the same thing. It's sin. Turn from that stuff. That's what repentance means. Turn and go the other way. Then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins. How we get forgiveness of sins, that's only through Christ, and I will heal their land. If there's any hope for America, it's Jesus. If there's any hope for you and me, it's Jesus. Now, here's the question. Are we just going to keep doing that which is right in our own eyes? Or are we going to say, God, your way, your word, your truth? I'll let you in on something. If you want to keep doing it your way, if you want to keep doing it the world's way, sooner or later, you're going to realize that it's failed you. And when that happens, I think then you'll turn to Christ. But let's cut out those steps come to Jesus now the world does not have a solution for your problem the world does not have an answer the world doesn't have what's the hope that you need the world doesn't have that stuff it's only in the word of God it's only in Jesus I did my doctoral work on that is there anything we can't have an answer for in the word of God I told you I think I did 75 topics I didn't find anything and I just made up topics they went to hunt for them found answers for them all in the Word of God. This Bible is as relevant in 2018 as it was in 2018 B.C. And for those of you who have subscribed to the New Way of Calculating Time, B.C. means for before Christ. It will always mean before Christ. That's just a little... Like that, Eddie? Like it. Are we going to do it our way? Or are we going to let Jesus have His way? Folks, for the benefit of your family, for the benefit of your church, for your benefit going forward let's do it God's way let's don't be like Mike and his mama <laughs> if you read on a little bit further Micah starts his own church in his own house that's a whole other message for another day but you can see how everything starts to unravel when they did things the way they wanted to do them let God be true and every man a liar let's stand all around church this morning